In today's video, we're going to use graph theory to figure out some cool patterns in the Pokemon type chart. Have you ever wondered what it'd be like if a Pokemon game changed types of the starters? In Gen 6, Pokemon added the secondary type cycle, Fighting, Dark, and Psychic to the starters, but what are all the possible options? And what if the Pokemon company decided to add more starters to a game, more than three? How many cycles could they make in that case? Well, today we're going to answer these questions and more, and also discuss advanced graph theory algorithms used to find all cycles in the complex network that is the Pokemon type chart. First off, I'm not going to explain how Pokemon types work, because I'm going to hypothesize that if you're here, you either like Pokemon or you like algorithms. And if you like algorithms, you probably like Pokemon. Let's dig into the video. In computer science, when we want to apply a relationship against a set in code, such as person X knows person Y against a set of people, or such as Pokemon type X being super effective to type Y against a set of Pokemon types, we get a graph. A graph is a set of vertices and edges. The vertices in our case are simply the set of Pokemon types, and the edges in our case link two types together if the first vertex beats the second vertex. Cool, so now we have a set of vertices and a set of edges. We can't capture arrows in our code without getting messy, so we define an arrow as its starting point paired together with its ending point. We also want to capture our graph using more efficient data structures than simply sets. It sucks to have to do a search for all edges if we want to see how one type relates to another. We have two classic options for doing this. The first is an adjacency list, which is pretty much a mapping between a vertex and each of the vertexes that it relates to. In our case, a mapping between a type and the types that it beats. I just want to pause for a second and mention that if you did want to capture how types are related to each other, you probably, without knowing how graphs work, would have done this on your own intuitively. So don't feel overwhelmed because we're just formalizing intuitive ideas here. Alternatively, we have the adjacency matrix, a great example of which being the Pokemon type chart itself. If there's a relationship between two types, the cell where those two types intersect will be filled in. For example, if we look at any cell in the chart where we see a 2x, we know that the Pokemon type on the left of the matrix is super effective to the type on the top of the matrix. For this video, we're going to continue with the adjacency list because the algorithm we use to find our cycles relies on that structure. Also, we're not done yet because we still can't translate this to code exactly. To save this into code, we need to make a mapping between some non-negative integer and Pokemon types, because a Pokemon type is not something that exists in code. Also, using numbers to represent types lets us change this mapping to the most efficient kind of mapping, the array. As you know, we can access items in an array by index, and now that our types are numbers, our indices are actually types. So the first element in the array is actually everything that fire type beats, for example. So now we know everything we need to know about graphs for this video. And now that we have our relationship in code, we can do some analysis on it. There's a bunch of things we can do from here. For example, ranking the types by which has the most advantages, finding the advantages of dual types, topic for another video. And as mentioned in the beginning, we're going to try to answer the question of how many unique cycle types exist in this game. Before I continue, I want to warn you guys that the video is about to cover an advanced algorithm, albeit put very intuitively. So if you guys just want answers, skip to the final chapter. But if you're curious or want to test your comprehension, stay tuned. And please subscribe if you haven't already. To form the algorithm that'll help us answer our questions, it'll surprisingly help us to understand how you decide to dress up for a nice event. You start by picking out a shirt. Then based on that, you pick out some pants, then some shoes. Then you realize you don't like the combination, so you try different shoes. But you still don't like it, so you take a complete step back and then try new pants. You still need to try all your shoes again, because with your new pants, they might actually look good. Eventually, you find an outfit that you like. What you just did was try every possible combination of clothing. If we think of shirts, pants, and shoes as slots, there are three options for each slot in our case. In general, the total amount of possibilities we have is options to the power of slots or positions. On top of that, we can think of each possibility as a path. So there are also as many paths to take as there are possibilities. We can use similar logic to find all paths in any graph. From a starting point, we loop over each neighboring vertex and branch into each of them carefully. Now to avoid branching into a vertex we've already branched into, we can leave breadcrumbs through marking nodes and we can avoid them. In code, we can do that by keeping a collection of where we've already been. Basically, we loop through each neighbor and mark it as visited before branching into it recursively. We also backtrack so that we can retry this neighbor later from another vertex. Think backtracking to pants and trying the same shoes again. This is our algorithm for finding all paths from a specific start vertex S. The correctness of this algorithm is similar, if not the same, is that of the algorithm behind trying all clothes, and the runtime is calculated similarly to the number of possibilities of clothes. Except this time, every time we make a choice, our pool of options is decreased by 1, so we get a slightly better runtime, v factorial instead of v to the power of v. But how does this help us find all cycles from S? Well, from here it's pretty straightforward. We just check if the vertex we're on is neighbors with S, 
And if it is, we found the cycle and save it in the list. I'm going to start keeping track of changes I've made to the original algorithm with this little green line so you remember how we got to where we get. Like I said, this algorithm generates all cycles from a specific vertex. Thus, we can generate all cycles in the graph by looping over each vertex and calling this algorithm on each of them. The only problem is that because of the nature of cycles, we can find multiple permutations, or rotations if you prefer, of the same cycle. For example, in our graph, when we start from 1, or when we start from 5, we'll find the same cycle. Let's refer to this idea as a class of cycles. We need to find a way to capture only one cycle from a class. Now naturally, we can solve this problem by adding an extra step in our check for cycles that only lets us add a cycle if we haven't already added a permutation of that cycle in our list of all cycles. As a bonus algorithm, we can check if two lists are permutations of each other by finding the first item in the first list, anywhere in the second list, and then checking the rest of the list to see if the items follow in the same order. So this is the bare minimum algorithm we can use to find all cycles. Now let's analyze its runtime. We know our algorithm performs an O of V factorial operations, and across all of them it does some work. Specifically, deduplication work and the work of saving every cycle we find. In algorithms, we can specify runtime not only in terms of input size, but in terms of output size as well. So let's say the amount of cycles we find is capital C. The amount of work we do deduplicating sums to VC squared, which is a geometric series, and the amount of time spent adding to the list of all cycles is the amount of cycles times the maximum size of a cycle. In the end, we get O of V factorial plus C squared V. We can now answer our question, but first I'd like to bring light to a clever trick, which is decently hard to find on the internet, that'll greatly improve our algorithm's speed. In 1970, an intelligent computer scientist named James C. Tiernan noticed that we can ensure every cycle we encounter is unique if we add one simple condition to our path extension. Did you see the difference? The difference is that we only branch to neighbors that are greater than the first vertex, S, that we branched from. It's not obvious as to why this would lead to unique cycles, but I'm going to simplify Tiernan's proof as to why it does by turning his proof into an intuitive analogy. We're going to need to reason through this proof in two steps. Firstly, we need to show that we get at most one of each cycle. And secondly, we need to show that we find at least one of each cycle. Putting these two together implies that we'll get exactly one of each cycle. Let's take a look at the first part. Why we only find one permutation of a cycle when W is greater than S. In a nutshell, our algorithm works by starting at a unique vertex S at each iteration and only looking at vertices greater than S. This means all paths we find take the form of S to V where s is the smallest in a circuit. And in a class of cycles that are duplicates of each other, there's only one cycle where s is the smallest. We can turn this into a nice analogy about a circle on a plane. Again, our algorithm starts at some s and moves forward to vertices bigger than it only. This is analogous to picking a starting point, s, of a circle, and having to complete the circle. There's only one way you can do it from a specific starting point. Similarly, there's only one cycle of any class of cycles that starts with s. Okay, so that's the big idea for us to realize we'll only find at most one of each cycle. But now how do we ensure that we still find at least one kind of each cycle and that we don't ignore any cycles? We're going to do that by looking at these two facts. Fact one, as we just mentioned a few times, we will find all the paths that take the form S to V where the cycle is of any length. Fact two, every class of duplicate cycles that exists in our input graph can be simply represented by the single version of the cycle that starts with S. Therefore, we report only one cycle of every class. This is the second part of the proof. Personally, the second part didn't sit well with me the first time I heard it, because it felt like we didn't really prove anything. However, it does make sense if you think about it. Let's quickly do the runtime analysis to see why this algorithm is better than the one we had before. But very simply, it's the same analysis, except we're making the deduplication work negligible. So in the end, we get O of V factorial plus CV. Before we get back to Pokemon, I want to mention this algorithm I've presented to you is not exactly Tiernan's algorithm, but a rewrite of the algorithm I wrote for this video that works for the same reasons. I developed the algorithm based on a more efficient cycle enumeration algorithm developed by Robert E. Tarjan, who is among the smartest computer scientists alive today. While we're talking about other algorithms, it's worth mentioning that there's another so-called circuit enumeration algorithm written by Donald B. Johnson that is the state of the art of this problem. Here's a summary of all the algorithms I mentioned. Finally, let's get back to Pokemon. Now that we've proven this algorithm will find all cycles, we can answer our burning questions. How many Pokemon cycles are there? Here's our algorithm in Python. I'll make this code available in GitHub shortly after I post this video. Well, it turns out there are 2,924 cycles that we can make with Pokemon types. This includes cycles of any length from 1 to 16. Here are some of the cycles printed out. If we look at any of these cycles, we can indeed confirm that it is a cycle by looking at every type in the cycle and confirming that it beats the next type. Now there's a lot of cycles, so if you'd like, download this Jupyter Notebook yourself and you can start playing around and analyzing it yourself. We can do some cool queries, like finding all cycles of length 3, 
any of which can make for a cool swap for starter types. My favorite is fire, ice, and ground. Ice is a strong type, but sadly they're usually located in snowy regions, which also happen to appear deep in the game. Also, some of you might be displeased with this cycle and ones like it, because this cycle doesn't apply in reverse. Ice is not resistant to ground, so it's not exactly like the classic starter trio in Pokemon in terms of types. If we did want to be really strict with ourselves, we end up getting 5 cycles that could work for starter trios. Notice that one of the cycles we see is fighting, dark, and psychic, which, as I said earlier, Pokemon used as secondary types for the Gen 6 starters. One of the cooler ones here is Grass, Ground, and Poison because it seems like it'd give players a really different experience than usual. It would be tougher to play through because Grass and Poison are not aggressive types. Fighting, Rock, and Flying seems like it'd provide a unique playthrough experience while being similarly difficult to playthroughs with the classic trio. Okay guys, we finally answered our big question, and we opened the door for so many other questions to be answered as well. I highly encourage you guys to download the code and let us know in the comments what you find. What do you guys think about changing the starter types? Would it be fun, or would Pokemon lose too much of its identity and become too complicated? I personally think it'd be cool to see types like Ice or Poison appear as part of starter trios. It'd make for much different gameplay experience. I think a cool use case for longer cycles would be for use in Pokemon MMORPGs where X amount of friends decide to start at the same time by picking from a cycle of length X. One last thing I want to mention before I go is that this video was heavily inspired by an amazing video made by another YouTuber that I'll link below. If you like this video, either check that one out or check my most recent Pokemon video about how to code up one of my favorite Pokemon minigames. Thank you guys for watching.